Uh, this next panel brings together investors and the brands that they've invested in. And I'm very pleased to introduce Genevieve Gilbreth, co-founder and general partner at Springdale Ventures, an early stage consumer goods investment fund here in Austin. She has been an active investor and entrepreneur in the consumer goods space for the last 15 years, founded and operated two import export supplement companies. And she, she also served as the managing director for SKU, the first and leading consumer product accelerator here in the United States. Genevieve is also a founding member of Naturally Austin and the National, the National Naturally Network. That is tough to say. So welcome, Jen, and take it away. Thanks, Katrina. Yeah, yeah, so excited to be here today. And it was really great listening to that last panel. Really good words of wisdom and I think a perfect segue into what we're gonna talk about here today. Um, and so we're focusing here on how to work with your investors. So once you have the investors on board, this isn't so much how to go out and find investors. It's about once you have investors on board, how do you really make the most of that relationship to um, leverage it for more than just capital? And we have a group of uh, great folks here today with us. And we've got Rihanna Lynn, Journey Foods, Ethan uh, Monreal Jackson of Notley and Agave Fund, and Amy Stedman of Future Proof Beatbox Beverages. So let them uh, take a few minutes and introduce themselves and then we'll go from there. So Rihanna, you wanna kick us off? Yes, thank you so much. I'm, I'm very excited about today. What wonderful programming, so many great faces to meet and, and, and familiar faces as well. Uh, so I am the, the co-founder and CEO of Journey Foods. Uh, very excited to be based here in Austin. Uh, and, and one of our fellow investors uh, is one of our investors actually on the panel here today. So I'm very excited for this exchange. Uh, but we've, uh, Journey Foods, we've raised uh, a few million dollars now. Uh, I've worked also on the, on the venture side as well. Uh, and I cannot say that we have everything right, but I, I can say that um, from my experience, talent is so hard to come by, especially pre-seed, seed, series A. Uh, and I definitely want to share how, how much and how valuable it is to choose investors that are very mission aligned, but also have a portfolio and a set of skills that can help you scale and grow uh, and also in, and find your, your blind spots. So happy to share that today coming from both the food and tech side as Journey Foods is a B2B software company that's focused on helping CPG companies grow uh, within their portfolios. Uh, and uh, yes, thank you so much for the invite. And I I'd love to share more of how we have managed investors over the past two and a half years since we started raising our pre-seed. Great, thank you. Amy, how about you? Hey, I'm Amy Stedman. I'm the co-founder and chief operating officer for Future Proof Brands. We make Beatbox Beverages, which is the number one a cocktail and wine brand in the U.S. right now in terms of dollars generated per store. Uh, we're super excited about that. Just did a, a big announcement about that last week, so I wanted to blurt that out as well. Um, I'm also lucky enough to be the board president for Naturally Austin this year, um, so super excited to see everybody on the event today. Um, my experience with fundraising is very long. Uh, it'll be 10 years for me and my partner starting my company in November this year. And so we have raised more than $14.6 million, all from angels, basically. Genevieve is my investor as well through Springdale Ventures. And Springdale Ventures is one of the only actual funds that has invested in beatbox beverages, future-proof brands. Hi, guys. Um, and so, yeah, we've done a lot of just grinding for angel investment. So super happy to share what have I experienced and hopefully it's helpful for everybody on the call today. Um, we did a series seed on Shark Tank. We got Mark Cuban involved at that time. So many of y'all may have seen that. That was back in 2014. Uh, so that was a while ago. And then we've done a series A, a series B, and now we're doing a equity crowdfunding round. I'll, I'll put it in the link for you so you can see all of our historical raises are on there, all of our fundraising decks, everything. So you guys can get into all the details if you want to nerd out about fundraising. So um, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Amy. Ethan, you're up. Hey, folks. My name is Ethan. And uh, as Jen mentioned, I am a principal at, at Motley. And I also lead a syndicate fund uh, with, with my partner on there, Kelly Mason. She's a Notley partner as well a syndicate fund called the Gave Fund, where we invest in 
Black, Hispanic, and Native American-led startups, and and our second investment was in was in Rihanna Lynn's Journey Food. So we're we were so excited to get to invest in her. We felt it was a privilege, frankly, to be able to invest in her and, and alongside some of the other great investors that she has. Uh, additionally, I'm really fortunate to get to work with Genevieve. So I also support Springdale Ventures, and I, I have a bit of a, a different background from from most folks. Uh, I started out in consulting. And then uh, very quickly realized that, you know, I was losing my mind and wasting, wasting my energy doing that job. And so I moved over into banking. And then uh, after three years of banking, I moved to San Francisco to work in tech, at a bunch of early stage startups, one of which recently uh, IPO. And so uh, my background is more on the finance fintech side. And then I launched my own fintech startup that was a savings app that, that I coded up and built myself. Uh, I actually had opportunities to raise money with Lightspeed Ventures, uh, what, you know, one of the famous VCs that invested in, in Snapchat as, as an example, and uh, Live Oak in Austin, actually. So I, I've been on the other side of it. Uh, I actually turned down the opportunities. And, uh, and, and so I, I, I've, I've gotten to see what it's like to raise money, what it's like to, to make you know, the decision not to, not to take on money. And now as an investor, uh, both on the angel side and the venture side, I get to see different flavors of investing. So uh, hopefully it'll, that, that background will be beneficial to folks on this panel today. Super, thank you. I think that's actually, it's interesting thing about this panel is that from Rihanna, Ethan, and even myself, we've kind of sat on both sides of the table, whether it's the startup side, one of my companies, I raised some capital and then on the investing side. So we kind of have the, the full circle picture of, of what it's like, at least at the earlier stages for, for raising and deploying capital. Um, I think it'd be beneficial at this point to kind of dig into some specifics around the founder investor relationship. And um, Ethan and Rihanna would love to start with the two of you. If y'all could talk about kind of what it was that that made you connect, Ethan, that kind of drew you to um, invest in Journey Foods and, and Rihanna, what you know, what you found appealing about um, Agave Fund through the investment, and then talk a little bit about how that relationship has has evolved and how you kind of make the most of it. Absolutely. I mean, I could start there. You know, for us. Uh, at Journey Foods, we've turned down a lot of uh, strategic investments from uh, CPG companies over the past year and a half. And one thing that really drew me to um, both Kelly and Ethan as they were discussing uh, the launch of the Agave Fund was not only that they had a mission-driven alignment in, in being that um, minority entrepreneur, but really their background. Uh, you know, we are trying to scale a software company in the food industry. And for us, it was important that we found investors that had similar experience or had invested in companies that had the same trajectory that we're trying to go after. And so when Ethan, you know, Ethan has been a tremendous help and asset to even my team. I mean, they've jumped on Zoom calls with him, some of his buddies from, from the company he mentioned that IPO'd recently and uh, we've talked about everything from design sprints to um, optimizing our website. And so it was very important to me uh, to have the, the alignment around engineering uh, and that experience, but also on Kelly's side, who, who's wonderful. I mean, she's helped us a lot with HR and hiring and, and just uh, everything from just building company culture. And so when we think about investors, we really want to make sure that we understand uh, as a company, where our gaps really lie, whether it be uh, engineering products, overall uh, industry experience. Uh, it, for, for CPG, oftentimes it could be packaging or marketing or you know, distribution strategy. And so what we do uh, as, as a team is one, we take a skills assessment every single per person and contractor at the company we take a skills assessment every like two or three months uh, to make sure that we can find the gaps and 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 where we either need to reach out to our investors or, or potentially hire to fill those in and uh that's worked tremendously well for us as, as we as we found alignment with investors that we want to work with and so uh, i love that ethan can 
shoot off an email to me and say like, hey, there's something like buggy on your website, you might want to fix that. Or do you want to chat with me and one of my engineering brothers around, you know, designing a sprint and my team members have jumped on and found it incredibly valuable. I mean, they've even said things like, I can't believe we're going to pay for this Coursera or this general assembly class. And we've, we spent 90 minutes with, with Ethan and uh, we were able to gather just as much as like the preview class that we thought we had to take. Uh, and so that's just like so valuable to me. And, you know, beyond just writing the check, that's going to be so important because your investor relationship lasts multiple, multiple years. And you want to make sure that uh, you have folks that understand your, up, your, your highs and your lows. They understand those valleys and those trenches that you have to go to through, but also the fact that like, as a series C, series A company, you're not gonna be able to hire the best talent. Now, like we're in Austin now, people are moving to Texas, much much greater uh, like ecosystem of talent is being built here. And we can recruit a little bit better compared to you know even a year ago, two years ago, but we still cannot pay top dollar. You have to have the conviction of the, the mission of the company uh, as well as some backing to really hire some strong talent. Uh, unless you have just like your great network. And so uh, I think that's helped us a lot. It's like understanding talent and uh, opportunity gaps and, and sort of uh, skills gaps for the investors that we align with. Well, Rihanna is too nice. And so after this, I'll make sure to Venmo you for, for those comments. I appreciate it. Uh, in, in, all, in all seriousness, you know, I'll be honest with folks, we don't write the biggest checks, right? Like Agave Fund, it's a syndicate. You know, once we decide to invest, we got to go out there. We got to we got to get the funds together. And for folks like Rihanna, you know, Rihanna is is frankly a, a superstar. She, you know, she's done multiple startups. She's already had exits. You know, we were lucky to get into that deal. The only way you get into it is if you bring something else to the table. And so Kelly, my fantastic partner on Agave Fund, we're we're very we're very clear that if we want to get in these deals and win these deals, and we're, we're really excited to announce a couple more who will get to join uh, alongside Rihanna and our portfolio companies, we have to bring something to the table. And so I think when you're looking for investment, it's very easy to say, you know, hey, you know, they're going to cut me a check, you know, maybe I should just take it. But to Rihanna's point, you really have to make sure that these are folks with whom you're going to have a, a long relationship with, one that's enjoyable. And frankly, I think Genevieve has done a really good job on the Springdale side, working with her, uh, watching her, seeing how she interacts with her portfolio companies. That's informed a lot of how I try to interact with our portfolio companies. And so for us, Rihanna makes it easy because she's, she's, you know, she's never afraid to ask us if we can help out. She's, she's very direct and, and open and honest. And that makes it easy on our side because as investors, we can't help you if we don't know what it is that you're going through, you know? If you're having a talent problem or a, a customer problem, or you know, one of our portfolio companies on Springdale Ventures is, is, is looking for help on, on the, the debt side. And that's actually something that I, I know a little bit about with, with my background, right? But we can't help you if we don't know what your problems are. And so I think it's best for everybody if you're open and honest, because then, then we can all just you know, reach, a, reach a solution, find something. And so I think with, with investors, I mean, founders, particularly I was this way, you know, I only wanted to share good news. I only wanted to say, hey, you know, we, we have no problems because we've solved them. And that turned out to be a fatal flaw, at least when I was working on my startup. So I, I think Rihanna, not, not only is she super smart, but she's super wise for, for being open and honest about, hey, here are the things that we're trying to solve. And then Kelly and I and others can tap into our network and help her out. And so I would encourage founders on this call that, you know, you're probably not using your investors enough. Let's, let's put it that way. And we have the easiest job. We just sit here and, you know, y'all do all the work and we get a piece of it. That's not fair. So really, you know, force investors to actually earn their investment in you because it is a privilege, right? If you're going to succeed, they should be doing something to get you to that next level, whether it's moving your probability of success from 60% to 61%, 65%, whatever. Make sure that you're getting as much, if not more, out of your investors as, as they are of you. 
That's such a good point, Ethan, and one I think we should come back to at least 10 times over the course of this next hour. I think communication and just being transparent on both sides is so important. Um, so I'll, I'll harp on that a little bit later. But um, Amy, we'll turn it to you now to um, yeah, talk about, I guess, our, our relationship, uh, how it is kind of we, when we came into the, to the scene and kind of how we work together. Yeah, for sure. Well, I um, started fundraising for Beatbox back in, you know, 2012, 2013. And that's when I'm, you know, around the same time that I met Dan Graham, which is obviously Genevieve's partner in Springfield Ventures. And so I had been pitching Dan on Beatbox for many, many, many years uh, before uh, y'all actually came in as investors. Um, and so, you know, just wanted to bring that up as a point. I know it brought, it came up in the last panel, but um, just, just keep in contact with really great people um, that are in your world and it may not work out this particular month or deal but there may be something y'all can do together in the future and so um, just high level that's kind of my strategy as a founder right my job is to do biz dev for my company whether it's fundraising whether it's bringing in marketing partners or operations partners that are going to accelerate my company not 20 percent, but 20x right like that's my role as a founder and so I look at fundraising that way too. Like we're looking at bringing in funds. Of course, we need money to grow the business, but you know, similar to what Rihanna and Ethan were talking about, like if it's a, a high net worth person or if it's something like Spring Door Ventures, there's different ways that you can go about communicating with those groups to kind of identify how else you can get benefit from the relationship and uh, with Genevieve and Dan at Springdale, uh, y'all set up a Slack, right, for all of the portfolio companies. And so we're all on there. And I have talked to many of the other founders about, you know, here in Alcohol Beverage, we uh, are just now stepping our toes into e-commerce, for example, whereas a lot of the other portfolio companies are very specialized in e-commerce. And so Genevieve, you know, created this platform, but it was up to me to reach out to the other founders and make connections you know, ask Genevieve for introductions and things like that, because we're stepping into this new world and I wanted to learn about it, similar to what Rihanna was saying about building those skills. Um, and then also wanted to comment on the debt part. You know, we, we, we always need things from hiring people to, hey, we need to finance our inventory with a debt um, vehicle versus raise funds via equity for the company growth. Um, you know, hey, we want to bring in an awesome marketing partner for our new product release. Like, lots of different things that you may not think to ask your investors, but they already have a bet on you in the race, you know? So they, they, they more than anyone are motivated to help you. And so it's just remembering every, you know, every month or every week, or especially with the quarterly updates, of course, and, and framing those asks up to your investors in a way. I kind of, uh, we have brand ambassadors at Beatbox where you know, we have them go to events and, and do sampling and things like that for us. So I just think of investors as another group of brand ambassadors. And we got to really package it up, the asks for them. So it's easy for them to activate on just like you would for your um, marketing brand ambassadors. So a little bit of summary on that. I love, uh, happy to talk a lot more about any of those topics for sure. We'll definitely dive into to more of those. I think it's a great point you brought up about making your investors your brand ambassadors. And especially since, you know, we're women in CPG topic today, and most of you have companies that you have brands that you can be promoting, or I mean, even if it's more of a, a service or a software, there's still, um, you know, you still can be out there promoting it to companies that you, you engage with. So I think that that's, you know, investors, it's particularly early stage investors, you know, they're, they're making these bets because they believe in the team, they believe in the company, but also probably because they have a passion for what you're doing, um, particularly angels. Um, so you want to you want to capitalize on that. So truly making them making them your ambassadors is, is a great idea. Um, and I think Amy kind of brought you brought up a great point about how we look to help our portfolio companies. You know, we're a small team and we have 18 portfolio companies at the moment. So it's like we don't have the bandwidth to, you know, really get in there and be operating the company with you on kind of a day to day basis, nor do we really want to. You know, we've uh, been we've been operators and we're still we love to do that. But right now it's uh, we like to to be there to really help remove obstacles and to help you move faster and kind of just just get those get the things out of your way or provide you stepping stones or connections, things that you need to help you take it the next 
the next level. So I think that that's a that's an important differentiation on how some funds work. You know, some some investors and some funds will, will invest their you know hundred million dollar um, fund into six different companies, for example. Or we have you know a more a broad spread across ours. So really, what we see is you know the ability to you know to make those connections and and remove obstacles. Um, one thing I'd say too is that you know across all the, the companies, communication is just so important in making sure that you set those expectations from the beginning. So even as you're entering into a relationship with a founder or investor, you want to be very, very clear about what it is that your expectations are, what it is that you're gonna provide. You don't wanna be selling something that you're not gonna deliver on. And I think that's really important. So, um, you know, when, when companies come and pitch us, that's, that's generally what we do. It's like, hey, we're not gonna jump in and be that hands-on team that needs weekly reports and wants to get in the weeds with you. We're, we're the team that, you know, wants to support you and help you take it where you need to go. So you need to, you know, communicate, make sure that you're communicating with us. So I think that that's, um, that's a really important thing to do is just setting clear expectations and um, boundaries, more or less. Cool. I think right. that's an interesting point because, you know, I would say of our, um, we have a, a newsletter list of, of more than 25 investors, angels, investors, and, and some of the partners at the firms. And uh, one thing that I've found is I still have direct contact with uh, some of the some of the partners or LPs or angels through various means outside of just our new our, our group list that goes out through through email. So WhatsApp, text, uh, even you know directly through through Twitter or LinkedIn and um, they, they all range just on, on comfort, on you know, stage, when some of them came in, uh, pre-seed, some of us have conversations just about you know, really, really tough issues um, from you know, team dynamics to turning down certain investors because we just don't think that it's a, we don't, we don't vibe well. Uh, and so I think uh, one thing that you should do is just like sort of understand what's the baseline for all of your investors in terms of communication, you know, com communicating with them at least one time a month, even if it's just like a quick ping through email is probably, I think the best strategy, but I found that some investors need a little bit more time from, from me than others. And, and having that conversation, even before you receive the check is, is I think going to help make sure that the relationship can stay pretty even time. It's such a good point. I mean, I would even go so far as, you know, as you're pitching investors being like, hey, this is once we, once we start working together, once we get married, this is how I plan on communicating with you. Does this, how does, does this sound okay to you? Does this look good? Get, get the buy-in, you know, because then it's like you've made this agreement and you can, you know, move forward with confidence that everybody's agreed to this. And that doesn't mean that things won't change, but, um, you know, it's a, it's a good place to start. And I really liked your earlier comment, Rihanna, about the skills test. You know, when we help startups start to think about forming boards, we create board matrices that, that kind of make sure that you're covering different talent aspects that you need. Um, but I think taking it, yeah, one step further and, and kind of making sure that you're thinking about skills or needs in the board is, is a great thing. And I think that that's another thing that I would recommend creates a really healthy working relationship. Um, so we've actually built out uh, like a chart that includes both our investors and our team. Uh, so we have, we have separate ones and then we put them together. And so uh, we don't send the same survey out to our investors that we do to the team, but at least we're able to, we use actually ping board org charts. And we're able to really see like and assess where we may need to place certain investors after we do a quick review of our org chart and, and just send out a Google form to our team for the skills assessment. Very smart. Um, Maybe we should spill a little bit of tea here and uh, dig into, have you ever had any, you don't know, no names, don't name any names, but has there ever been um, 
issues that have come up that have been difficult to resolve with investors, or maybe you haven't had those issues come up yet. Hope you haven't. But um, maybe let's talk about a little bit about kind of what are some red flags that you've seen before investing, and maybe you moved forward with it in any case, or after you've taken money from investors, um, what issues have arisen and how have you dealt with it? Amy or Rihanna, what's y'all, or Ethan too, who <laughs> can, any of us can take that one. Um, either of you feel like going first, I can dive in a little bit. Um, yeah, we, we've had, you know, very good luck with 99% of the folks that have come in, thank God. I would just say uh, some of the stuff that has come up, um, it, it's just because, you know, when you're in business, there's just all kinds of people and no amount of vetting or uh, online Googling can really truly reveal somebody's character to you. But uh, I think it would it, it is helpful, of course, if you're bringing in somebody as a major investor, especially somebody that maybe having a seat on the board or having um, influence in the company beyond, you know, a minor investment that there is a vetting process, including references and things like that, hopefully from somebody else they've invested in too, so that you can uh, just kind of get a good information. It's just like bringing in top level talent, right? Like you want to check those references and make sure that you know how it's going to be and, and best prepare yourself um, if you do choose to bring that person in. Um, for us, we never had to do anything super major, so I don't really have any like great stories on that other than just having people transition from, um, you know, more formal advisors to not, um, and just being back to being an investor again. And those were all handled on sort of a, just a contract and conversational level, just communicating, say, Hey, you know, we're working on this thing together for additional equity. However, this project is no longer needed. You know, it was very formal kind of business structure conversation. And so I think it, as long as you can cr create it that way and the personalities don't erupt into drama too much when things like that happen, you know, fingers crossed um, that it's just like any other business relationship and everybody's busy, right? So um, a lot of times, as long as everybody's aligned on optimizing for making everybody the most money and having everybody have the most time back, um, usually people are aligned on that. So uh, without naming any names or, or doing any more drama than that, I think that's kind of my best personal experience with that and advice to offer from, from my own experiences. I think the reference piece is, is really great advice that AIM is giving. You should ask if, if possible, if they work with other startups, uh, ask to speak to some of those founders. I would also say that be careful you know, I, I, I typically divide capital into, into two, two categories. There's, there's startup capital, and that can be angels, it can be pitch competitions, it can be all sorts of different, all different sources, but really it's to help you just launch your startup, right? And then there's institutional capital, which is venture capital, almost 90, you know, 99% of the time, especially with some of the folks I've seen, uh, I'm an angel in, through Beam, and I angel invest this period on the side. I've seen on the startup capital side, folks engage with angels who, you know, they don't have many investments under their belt, or they make the, the, the mistake of putting in too much money into a startup. And so it becomes a personal thing. And so I, I would be careful on that, you know, with those kinds of angels, right? Like I actually know a story. Uh, I don't exactly know the part. I, I'm not, I'm never afraid to name names. So uh, unfortunately, I don't know the name. Otherwise, I would have named it. But there was a doctor who invested in a startup in, in Austin, and he put in, I think, 100 plus K into an investment. And uh, obviously, the startup was running into startup troubles. And that doctor really tried to get involved. And it's like, wait a minute, you're a doctor. You know, you're, you're not a founder. You don't know my business. Why are you trying to get involved? Right. And I would imagine that he probably made the you know, mistake that a lot of rookie angel investors do, which is they probably put more money than they're willing to part with, right? And that can lead to misalignment of incentives that can lead to, you know, tension, friction, all sorts of things. So I would encourage, or I, I would caution a lot of the, the founders on here, you know, don't just take any sort of money, really vet them and make sure that they have experience or if they don't have experience that they recognize that, you know, this is high risk. It's like, don't get into the game if you're not willing to take on risks. Scared money don't make none, you know? And 
Uh, those are just some of the the, the pitfalls uh, that I that I've seen. Or you could be like Rihanna, who set the terms with us very early and was like, you know, take it or leave it. And that was really, you know, I was I was really impressed that she did that because that is how you should go about it, right? You set the terms. Don't let them set them uh, upon you, right? Yeah, and you know, Ethan, I would say if you came to us a year or two ago, it wouldn't have been it wouldn't have been that cut and dry, right? Uh, and to your to your question, Genevieve, the, these are through years of lessons of, of raising. I mean, you don't get it right your first time around, or you, or unless you have just a phenomenal group of uh, of advisors, or you know, this is something that you grew up around. Um, my my advice is really from investments that we have not taken on, right? Uh, the the red flags from investors that we did not allow on our cap table. And one thing that I found was. Uh, you know, don't let investors waste your time. There are some, there are two time wasters. There are time wasters that like don't actually have the money to invest in you. They're kind of just like trying to slowly like do diligence while they themselves <laughs> raise money. And uh, some investors are not quite so uh, honest about that. And I think they need to be more transparent about that. They may have press or whatever it may be. And they want to get in and you're around, but they don't have, they haven't closed the funds yet. And I, we actually had an investor that was really hungry to get in that second round to give us more money. And we created like a tranche, a tranche deal with them where they could come in. We held some space for them. If they did not invest by a certain date, we, they, we would basically drop them off the cap table. You can do it that way. I mean, we're, everyone's still creating venture capital and like terms every single year, things change. Uh, so honesty and transparency and, and a good legal team is like really all you need. Uh, but also make sure that uh, some investors, unfortunately, want to talk to you for competitive means. We had an investor that wanted to take 90% of our round a year and a half ago. Uh, and I realized that uh, one of these investors, she sent me... Uh, some internal paperwork from one of our competitors. And she said like a friend sent this to me. And I learned six months later that she was like sort of on their board trying to invest in them too through like sort of, um, you know, non-capital non -capital means like through, through consulting. And she was trying to play both sides to see like which one of us would win. Um, but, but really dive into both of our business models and sort of build this trust and so you have to just like listen to yourself, but, but honestly do not waste time with it. There's so much money floating around. And, you know, unfortunately women, uh, minorities get a very, very small piece of the pie. And, you know, I think that is definitely gonna continue to change, but you cannot have, like people cannot waste your time. There's so many ways to make money from both your customers, from your community, from your family, from friends. Uh, and now fortunately more and more angels that uh, if, if you're spending more than a few weeks going through diligence and you just don't feel like they're going to really pull the trigger, then you have to say, like, come back to me when you have money. Come back to me when you can be honest. And uh, we'll talk in the future. Maybe we can get in a, a, another round. And I, I would totally agree with that. I would just say, like, sometimes you're hopeful that it's going to work out, but you just have to kind of really be honest and say, look, this person, obviously there's something going on there. So we need to kind of wrap this up and, and move on one way or another. So totally feel that. I think that's just such great advice. I remember when I was first raising money, you know, I feel like there's, you know, some, some investors who it's, this is entertainment for them. You know, this is kind of how they spend their time, you know, filling their time, hearing founders pitch and kind of digging in. And it took me a really long time to realize that, you know, that is the case. So those of you founders that are out there raising now, listen, just listen to these words and take it to heart. And, you know, if the process keeps moving along, um, roll with it. And, you know, even ask them, you know, what is your process for investment? What is your timeline? You know, show us the steps when we send out our, we, we've put together a deck that we send out to prospective brands just because we figure like, hey, it's only fair. They take the time to put together a deck and send it to us. We might as well do the same. So we're kind of reverse pitching them. And in the back page of that is our process. We used to have, I think, I think we may have had week, week, week by week in there, but you know, it varies because we can move a lot faster um, sometimes. 
so I think that that's a, a really important thing to, to remember as well. Um, we got a question here in the chat. It says, question for the founders. Can you expand more on the type of value you've received from your investors? And has that been more valuable than the capital itself? Anyone of y'all want to tackle that? Oh, we I can, yeah, go, go ahead, Rina. Sorry, I'll, I'll add after you. I was going to say the same thing, but thank you. Um, so we, we are fortunate to have, you know, not Lee, which I think is the tremendous for our Austin network. I don't even think we've tapped into it enough and I'm just really grateful to be here today. Uh, but we also have SOSV, Plug and Play and, and many others that are just have tremendous ecosystems. And I mean, they've, been, they've introduced us to some of the world's biggest food companies and software companies. Some of our investors have been introduced us to programs at leading universities that have supplied wonderful talent for us on the data science and engineering side. Um, I mean, we've had one thing that I, one question I've been asked quite often is around like managing capital and waste. And sometimes you get early, early money in and you find an agency or, or contract firm and Oftentimes, I think a lot of founders overspend on, on, on these uh, firms and because we just can't find the talent. And I've been so grateful to have the talent pool and partnerships uh, and also sales pool through some of our investors that I think, you know, has saved us a lot of money, but also uh, given us access to, to customers that have really helped our growth. I cannot yet quantify it, but I can definitely say that, it, you know, in the hundreds of thousands. And we, we spent a lot of time creating ROI charts like in Journey Fusions. Perhaps I'll, I'll create that at some point. But I, I do, I'm very grateful for the time saved and the sales opportunities from our investors. Well, we've done pretty much everything you can do. So I'll just summarize it. So we're an alcohol beverage company. We make party punch. And so, Inventory financing was one of the first things that Mark Cuban did above and beyond his Shark Tank investment for us, which was huge because, you know, this year is the first year as a company that will be profitable on an annual basis. And so this whole time operating a CPG company without being bankable, we've been dependent on our major investors for financing inventory. So that's a really big one. Today, we have another private investor. It's not Mark Cuban that does it, um, a group of investors that's coming in to do it. So that's something we've continued to do. Um, we also use it for sourcing talent, similar to Rihanna. We also have our uh, national key chains that we're targeting, right? My company is very laser focused on growing through national chain retail. And so we have our prospect list, our key accounts that we're trying to get in with. And so I will say Mark Cuban and Jeff Cuban helped us go to the 7-Eleven meeting and pitch 7-Eleven together all those years ago when we first started working together. And so being really deliberate saying, I would love to be in Target. Do you know anyone that's a buyer for Target? Can you come with me to the meeting if they have clout enough to, to make that a better thing and, and just packaging that up? So we've been you know working with our investors saying, hey, these are the specific uh, retail buyers that we really want to speak with. Do you know anyone? So that they can kind of think and not just say, oh, do you know any retail buyers? You know, in that way that they just kind of go blank. So um, that has happened. We also have a lot of celebrity investors. And so obviously Mark Cuban, but we have a lot of DJs. We have Rob Deerdick from MTV's Ridiculousness. And so we've activated all of those different people in different ways. We have a lot of up and coming sort of influencers. They're not like tier one celebrities, but they still have their audience. They're still super important to our brand and our authenticity. And so uh, we work with them to do things like store drop-ins, post on social media, Mark Cuban signed boxes at a liquor store for three hours one time. Like we've done, we yeah, we slapped the bag at the blind pig together for St. Patrick's Day and sold a uh, beatbox on 6th Street on St. Patrick's Day with Mark Cuban, which is really fun. Um, we just did like a PGA memes golf event with a bunch of golf influencers. And so my marketing team is awesome at this. Um, just kind of trying to figure out how to make it really fun for them. Maybe they have other investments or other things they're doing. They can promote at the same time while working with you, make it really easy and beneficial for them to participate with you. Um, so that's the kind of things that we do with celebrities. Um, we've also, uh, gotten, 
board, uh, like industry board advisors, other kinds of expertise. Uh, we run our company on entrepreneurs operating system, which is a very specific way of uh, running your meetings, setting your goals, all that kind of stuff. And so one of our investors actually did our whole implementation of that uh, process for us um, as an advisor. So that's just some of the things we've done, but uh, many, many different ways to use investors to help you move the business forward. Ethan, anything you want to add to that? Amy and Rihanna got it. Awesome. <laughs> I, yeah, I would just echo that really leveraging your investors networks. I think that that's something that can't be said enough really in, in anything that you're doing, whether it's running your own business or working a job or raising capital. It's like the power of social capital is, is so valuable and it's not talked about, I think, often enough. So if you feel like you have a need, tap into your investor network. And if they don't know somebody, ask them if there's somebody they might know that you would have the answer or the connection or, or whatnot. Um, got another question here from the crew. So if you do come across an investor who don't feel like is a good fit, but they're wanting to put money in, how do you politely decline? I send them my WeFunder link. <laughs> I'm like, honestly, it's never happened, to be honest with you. Um, so, Brianna, if you have experience, I'd love for you to share. No, the WeFunder link, that's funny. You know, for us, I think it's just like, hey, this is not a good strategic fit right now. Like, perhaps in a, another round, it'll work. But most of our misalignment has been with strategy. Or, or timing. I think that's a good point. And it kind of, it comes back to just being direct, open, honest communication. And there's, you know, it, I think that that, especially I've seen this for women founders and especially for myself, kind of, as I was getting started in this, it's, it's hard sometimes to be as direct as you would like to be, or as you should be, because you feel like, well, gosh, maybe they won't like me or my business or you know they won't help me move it forward so it, it really takes a lot of practice some, you know some people are just born with the ability to to be direct but other people it takes years of practice and really learning how to say things in a way where you're being direct and honest and um getting your point across i mean just just letting them know hey this isn't the right strategic fit i think you you know you'd be happier with another investment uh, i think that I think the reason it's never come up for me is because it kind of happens more in that first, second date process for me than like all the way at the ask for the ring stage. <laughs> I'm more like, hey, you're not a great fit. We're probably not going to follow up as much. And you know what I mean? Like usually an investor won't be just handing out money unless you're following up. And so I think that's kind of how we let it play out. Um, yeah. Cool. Awesome. Um, I guess then we've got some extra time here. Let's talk about once you have investors on board, just managing that relationship. So we talked about early, you know setting expectations early and following through with those expectations. But um, are there other tips that you all have, any of you, about how to how to get the most out of a relationship and and how to manage it kind of on an ongoing basis? Thinking of like more nitty gritty things. You know, something that I learned recently, um, and, and just to sort of echo what you said, Genevieve, about you know worrying what people think about you, or or just like being a little nervous around that that level of transparency. You know, for me, there are times when, especially in this, especially this past year, um, I'm a very product focused founder. Like I like to really dive into the product and the data, and I would rather not do press and, and other things uh and you know i'm grateful that it comes but there are weeks and months that i really would rather just spend with the team and not talking externally at all and i found that um sometimes i need to like directly communicate especially with some of my investors that are like whatsapp and i messaged me to to death uh, and I, I have great relationships because I love them, but some of them, I'm just like, you know, what? actually, I think like between this storm and my team and all these new hires, like I, I think I need like a week or two to just like not chat about anything, just like really get things together. And I, I found that like 
when I first started entrepreneurship, I was crazy. I like barely slept. Uh, and now I'm just like, think so much about resiliency and wellness and, and honesty. And it really, it, it really is a practice that you have to work into everything from your one-on-one -on -one relationships to the emails that you send out to all of your investors, like being honest about your founder, your, your founder state, your, your wellness state, your mental state, um, your team state, uh, and, and not being scared to add that to every list of of wins as well and, and really document that because um, you'll, you'll find that like half of the stress was just you feeling like you couldn't communicate that vulnerability. Mm -hmm. That's that's a great point. Um, and I think it ties into something as well when I talk to a lot of founders who have a hard time being vulnerable or being honest with their investors because they don't want to let them down. You know, they have this fear of, of letting them down or feeling like their investment isn't safe. And I think that, you know, especially anybody who's investing in early stage, whether it's seed to series A, they know that there's going to be bumps in the road. They know that there's going to be, you know, a pivot. Um, and they expect, you know, they expect if they have, if they're, have any experience at all, you know, investing in early stage companies, they know that there's emotional ups and downs and, and serious mental trials for founders, especially solo founders. So I think it's, you know, it's, it's, it's important to in, at an early stage, kind of be clear with that for yourself. And also, you know, when you're first engaging with um, investors, have that be part of the conversation. So I think that's a great point. Yeah, we've, uh, we try to keep some pretty regular cadence for communication so they know what to expect. So those those quarterly updates, quarterly in-person board meetings, recently they've been virtual, but typically they're in person. Um, and now that we have over a thousand WeFunder investors and fans that have come in, uh, incorporating kind of more town hall style events as well, like Instagram Lives, Facebook Lives, uh, for not just our fans, but also our investors. So we did a Insta uh, Instagram Live Ask Me Anything uh, town hall, which was really fun because we had both our customers and you know partners and investors popping in to ask about the business, ask about our new innovations, things like that. So um, yeah, just kind of tell, you know, like you said earlier, Genevieve, like telling people how it's going to be <laughs> when they come in as investors saying, hey, you're going to get an email once a month that has the highlights and the biggest asks, you know, every quarter, you're going to get a very detailed update that goes into everything, um, you know, at a medium kind of level and our biggest asks. And then, you know, whenever we're doing fundraising, you know, you're going to be hearing from me talking about the deal as a current investor, you're going to get uh, first right to to come in on our deals. So, our, you know, if that's the case, for example, um, you'll expect to hear from me whenever we open a new round, stuff like that. So um, I haven't had too many issues kind of setting boundaries other than just investors having ideas that they expect you to implement, like, you know, like, oh, you know, I really want this cool thing on the packaging or like whatever, you know, that's, we just kind of try to handle those as tactfully as possible. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think just trying to tell them how it's going to be, having that relationship and then, you know, making it easier for them. So I think everybody's just really busy and stressed, especially in today's world with how stressful everything is. So just, again, packaging it up, treating them like brand ambassadors and uh, making sure that they know exactly what, what's coming and when it's coming and what it's going to look like. And it makes it all so much easier. And, and I would say, remember, folks, we're all we're all people, and so sometimes I think, uh, I think on the investor side in particular, but even on the founder side, it can be more transactional than it should be, and so just treat folks like they're folks, because because that's what we are. You know, we're all people, and you know, when it comes to when, what I mean by that is, you know, I have one one founder uh, whom I invested in as an as an angel, and her unfortunately her her sister passed away this last year. And it was devastating for many reasons, right? I mean, just obviously it's, it's devastating to, to lose a sibling and to lose her sibling during, frankly, the best time in her startup's history. It's, it was, you know, shocking. And she and I text all the time. That's how we communicate. And she was radio silent for four months. And I never reached out because I knew she was grieving. 
And then, you know, one night she called me at 10 p.m. and we talked till 3 a.m., right? And it wasn't about being an investor. Uh, that's, she's just a human being going through something. And it wasn't about my, my investment or this or that. It's like, she's a person. And you just have to respond to that. And then I have other, you know, in, uh, other founders in my portfolio company where, you know, it is structured as, as Amy said, you know, it's once a month, I get an update. I know what to communicate, I know what to expect. And then I have other founders, you know, where, you know, sometimes when I know they're going through things, all of a sudden they start blowing up my, my phone. And then once things have kind of gone down a bit, then they just start emailing me again or sending me a notion or whatever, right? The point is, you know, we just have to be a little bit flexible, as Amy said, with given what everybody's going through. And remember at the end of the day that we are people and, and it's not the, you know, I'm not buying a stock, right? I'm investing in a group of people uh, you're taking on investment from a person, right? It needs to be a relationship, not a transaction. And I found that when you, when you treat it that way, it's, it's easier to kind of figure out communication. It's easier to be more open, more vulnerable, whatever, what, what, what have you. Uh, that being said, have boundaries, because I think uh, some, some, of my, uh, some of my portfolio companies really do take advantage of the fact that, that they can reach out to me, right? And uh, just as an example, this, this weekend, uh, my wife and I were celebrating her birthday. And so I had a bunch of folks, you know, it always seems to happen when I'm taking vacation, uh, reach out to me. And I've had to be really consistent and really, you know, and just say, no, I'm not going to respond to things, right? And sometimes it sucks. Sometimes you feel like, oh man, I'm not doing my job as an investor. I'm not doing my job as a founder, but you know, your, your job is not your life, right? It's one part of it. And so give yourself, cut yourself some slack and, and be willing to, you know, just say like, no, nope, I'm not gonna deal with it, right? Even if an investor is, is, is hitting you up or a founder is hitting you up, it's okay to say no sometimes. Such a good point. Something I think we should remember in all aspects of our life, you know. So there's always another person on the other side of the table who's got a whole complex life that they're dealing with. Um, I think you brought up a good point, too, about just something that I think about, you know, when I was a founder of a company, it was like that the company was my life. It was my baby. It was my everything. And, you know, and I think that as founders, a lot of times we have expectations that everyone else sees this baby in the same way that you do. And it's their number one first priority also. And I think that that's, you know, this, it's, it's not always the case that founders come to the table with that expectation, but it's, it's often. So I think that that's something as, as a founder, I would just always, you know, caution you against. It's like, okay, if you have your investors, they, they have their lives, they have their business, they have their obligations, particularly in our case, we have our obligations to our limited partners. So just as you have your obligations to your investors, we have obligations to ours. And so, you know, we have a number of companies that we're managing and we're, we're definitely there for our companies, but we've got, a, you know, 18 of them, not, not one. So I think that that's an important thing to, to keep in mind also. Great. Anybody have any other questions from the, from the crew here? You all ready to go out and uh, have great investor relationships now? You know how to communicate and, and manage? Good. I would say, Think about how you can bring your investors value to, because if they are invested in not just your company, then probably their company needs all, you know, their other company needs all the same things you're asking for, um, from intros to talent, to, you know, marketing partnerships, whatever. So, um, that, that's just another point is like, as a, as a portfolio company, uh, we do try to do some outreach and, and make sure that people know the resources that we have available, whether it's like, you know, I have a lot of female uh, leaders on my team, for example. So, and, and we're always trying to get mentors for our executives and our key leaders. And so just trying to say, hey, is there anyone that wants a peer mentor or colleague at another one of your portfolio companies that we could get all our marketing directors together or all our operations people together or whatever it is? Um, to try and, you know, bring value to the rest of the portfolio as well. So just wanted yeah, to put that out there. Yeah, I'll second that. Amy has been really tremendously helpful to another a number of our founders in the portfolio. And even as we're looking at deals, just getting kind of insider, fresh, top of mind information about market. So and I think data, nobody has data. So data, data. 
<laughs> well, well, please come to Journey Foods. And, yes, and, and go to Journey we, Foods. We <laughs> to offer the community, uh, you know, special discounts and access to the platform. Thank you so much. Hot in demand. Very good business to have. Yeah. I think that's one that's just brings up one point we touched on earlier, kind of a final point I'll leave with is when you're looking, you know, you're looking and bringing on different investors, be sure you're looking at the other companies that they've invested in and what those, you know, is it in the same space that you're working in or is it if you're a food company, are, they, are these investors only investing in tech and real estate? Um, then you're probably setting yourself up for some trouble because they don't necessarily understand kind of the life cycle of your food, food or beverage company. You know, I've seen that both at the angel level and then also at the institutional level. They'll be, you know, you've gone out for your, your series B and you've taken growth, growth capital from a firm that predominantly does tech, but they've decided they want to do some CPG now. So they've got five CPG investments and then five years down the road, they decide they're really not so good at CPG. So they want to try and dump those investments and have caused some very serious problems for the companies they've invested in. So that's something that I think is really, really important which you're, as you're looking to bring on investors. If they haven't invested in your category, you're going to be spending a lot of time educating them about your category when you could be pitching other investors that do invest in your category. So, yeah. Any parting words? I would say lean on each other and make sure that, you know, you are talk talking amongst each other about investors, about other startups, uh, especially, you know, uh, you know, not to get too dark, but we've seen what happens when we don't speak up, right? Like there's just a lot of awfulness that occurs, uh, uh, particularly to women founders when folks aren't sharing their experiences, uh, you know. And so if you have the ability to, the strength to, the resources to speak up, you should. And, and lean on, 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 your, on your allies, your friends, your family, uh, you know. Uh, obviously I'm not a woman. Uh, I don't even pretend to know the things that y'all go through. But as a black and Mexican man, I've been through my own uh, my own problems and, and dealt with a lot of racism. Even in Austin, you know, I've dealt with racism with some of the angels here, and I've been very open and I've named names. And I know that it's helped other founders, other other folks who are in this space, right? I've always known that you know, uh, you got to make noise if you want things to change. And so I would encourage all of you, you know, uh, lean on each other. You know, strength in numbers. Even if you yourself. Uh, uh, feel that you can't, you know, make the change on your own. I promise you that there are people on this, you know, on this call, there are folks in your network who, who are willing to support you and, and help you uh, speak up. So just make sure that you're not alone, uh, speak up, and, and really you'll be protecting the next founder that, that goes, you know, that enters into this space. I think the future of, of venture, of startups is going to be diverse and that you know whether it's 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 gender identity it's it's sexual orientation it's it's skin color what have you that's the future it's not going to look like what it, what what this past has been it's because of people like you who speak up who take the courage not only to launch your own startup but to be you right because there are folks you know who aren't in this and and they're looking up to you right now looking up to folks like Rihanna like Amy or like Genevieve who's leading Springdale Ventures and saying you know what if those folks can do it I certainly can do it as well because I, I'm just like them. So please speak up. Absolutely. Ethan always dropping some knowledge. Yeah, we we'll just leave it with that, Ethan. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Rihanna and Amy as well. Thank so, you. Uh, so happy to be really part of it. Yep, we're here for you here for the community, y'all. So thank you so much for joining today. Thank you all for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. And it sounds like you all have healthy and thriving marriages with your investors and portfolio companies. And I just love that we were able to bring brands in with the investors that have actually invested in them.